Hey everybody, it's Nathaniel Avila reporting from San Antonio, and I'm here with Timbro Hildebrand reporting from Crowley, Texas, I think. Yes. All right, so what are we talking about today? Uh, Mulan, I guess, not 2.0, but the first one. <laughs> yeah, 1.0. 1. So, uh, 1. 0, yes. yes. So what do you think about this? Uh, what's your first uh, initial thoughts about the original 1998 Mulan? What's so funny is, like, I didn't see this movie for, like, the longest time. And so, like, it's, when I saw it, I was kind of older. I wasn't, like, a kid. I mean, I was a kid, but I wasn't, like, really young. And I think it was good because I was able to kind of more appreciate some of the themes in it. Because it's a little bit more of a, it has some more, like, adult themes in it. But, um, I really, I really like Mulan. I mean, I like it because, like, you know, as a young woman, especially, like, as a young girl, getting to see a female Disney protagonist go out and, like, learn sword fighting and stuff like that was, was really cool. So I think it's a good story kind of about, like, friendship and, like, um, especially, like, you know, putting others before yourself and, like, you know, the importance of being true, you know, like, uh, honest and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a good movie. I enjoy it. It's funny, but also serious. It's got great music. So what's not to like? Yeah. How does this film compare to the remake that we just saw last week? Well, as I said last week, they are very different movies, which is why I think the, the reboot works, because they did their own thing instead of trying to vomit out what this one did. Because this movie is very different. It's shorter. It's a little bit more on the fun side, because it was intended more for younger audiences, but it also dealt with some pretty heavy subject matter, like warfare and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, they tried yeah, to... Like, it's a, it's a good, it's a good movie. I, but it's it's very different. Like it's definitely a little light, more lighthearted than yeah. the remake. Oh yeah, they they tried to get as much as they could for a G-rated war film. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so okay, that's so yeah. So here's some background about Mulan. So it goes all the way back to 1989 when uh, Walt Disney Feature Animation in Florida had opened with 40 to 50 employees with its original purpose to produce cartoon shorts and featurettes however by late 1993 following several animation duties on beauty and the beast aladdin and the lion king disney executives are convinced to allow the uh, the feature animation florida studios to produce their first independent film uh, around that time disney gave feature animation uh developed an interest into asian asian themed legends beginning with the optioning <laughs> several books by children's book author Robert D. Sansousi, who had a consulting relationship with Disney executive Jay Dyer. Uh, around that time, a short uh, straight-to-video film titled China Doll, about an oppressed and miserable, uh, miserable Chinese girl, is whisked away by a British Prince Charming to happiness in the West, was in development. Uh, sounds a bit problematic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Thomas Schumacher asked Sousey if he had any additional stories in which Sousey turned in a manuscript of a book based on the Chinese poem The Song of Fa Mulan. Mulan is two, two words. Ultimately, Disney decided to combine the two separate projects. Following the opening of the feature animation Florida Studios, Barry Cook, who had served as its special effects animator since 1982, had directed the Roger Rabbit cartoon Trail Mix-Up, produced at the Satellite Studio. Upon a lunch invitation with Thomas Schumacher, Cook was offered two projects in development, a Scottish folktale uh, with the dragon, or Mulan. Knowledgeable about the existence of dragons in Chinese mythology, Cook suggested adding a dragon to Mulan, in which a week later, Schumacher urged Cook to drop the Scottish Scottish project and accept Mulan as his next project. Following this, Cook was immediately assigned as the initial director of the project and cited influences from Charlie Chaplin and David Lean during the production, the most Chinese thing he can think of. So, <laughs> while working as an animator on the Gargoyles for uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Tony Bancroft was offered to co-direct the film following a recommendation from Rob Minkoff, the guy who made The Lion King, to Schumacher in which he accepted, and joined the creative team by early 1995. In 1994, 
The production team sent a select group of artistic supervisors to China for three weeks to take photographs and drawings of local landmarks for inspiration and soak up local culture. Key members of the creative team at the time, Pam Coates, Barry Cook, uh, Rick Sluter, Robert Walker, and Mark Henn were invited to travel China as a research trip to study the landscape, people, and history of the local legend. From June 17th, to July 2nd, 1994, the research trip flew to Beijing, uh, which is where Pam Coates became inspired by the placement of flags on the Great Wall. And they also toured uh, Datong, uh, Luoyang, Xi'an, Zhuayu uh, Guan, Danhuang, and Guilin. And that's the story of Mulan. Well, well. Yep. So, a lot of things happening here. So, let's start with the titular character of Mulan. How, how is she in this? I really like Mulan in this movie. I think she's a very relatable character because she kind of exemplifies that feeling of being, like, in way over your head. Um, and you really see that with her, that, like, she, she definitely tends to, like, act before she really thinks. But she always does it out of, like, good intentions. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, like, this this decision that she makes to um, take her father's place in the army is clearly, clearly born out of love, even if it's not born out of the best sense. Because when she gets there, she realizes that it's not so simple to just join the army and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, But the thing is, she's, like, very dedicated. Like, she's dedicated to, like, finishing what she starts. And I think that's really cool. Um, she's funny, you know, like she's, like, I, I especially love the, the scene where she first gets to the, uh, the camp and Mushu tells her how she's supposed to interact with men, how men interact, and she ends up embarrassing herself a lot because she, she's overselling it. <laughs> it's really funny. Uh-huh. So, like, like, when we first meet Mulan, she is supposed to be, like, um, the, I guess, conforming into what a woman is in the tradition of china uh at that point in time and it seems to me that she wants to do it but she just isn't good at it so <clears throat> so that's the rut there so and then uh she then transitions to being you know a guy so what do you think that whole thing is with her story arc, in order to find herself, she first has to, like, pretend to be another gender. I mean, I don't think it's so much about her pretending to be another gender as much as it's about her realizing that maybe her role isn't quite the same. She, she's better at other things. You know, she's a little bit, like, again, like, kind of like what you were saying, like, she was totally fine with, you know, just kind of, like, which, I mean, really fits the the culture that like she was fine with like serving her family duty like this was her duty you know to to get married being a mother you know this sort of thing like she was she was fine with that like she was cool with that being her role but like you said she realized she just wasn't very good at it so when she got to be in the army it wasn't so much about being a man quote unquote mm -hmm. but it was just a matter of like this is she realized that she was better at this you know when she was able to kind of like you know, she was she was seeking. She's always seeking something out of a good heart. You can tell, like she's seeking to do the right thing, keep her family safe, or preserve the honor, stuff like that. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that, like, she just realized that, like, you know, she's good at being a fighter and stuff like that. Like that was. I think that's kind of cool. You know, yeah. it's. I think it has to do with the fact that, like, she's pretending to be another gender. Like, she's better at being a guy or something <laughs> like that. I don't think that's. I don't think that's the point at all. I think the point is that you know she. She realized that like, she was good at being a soldier, so I think I think that's more what it's about. Yeah, like I know that like near like the end of the second act, the start of the third act, um, when she was left on the mountain, she actually says um, that she contemplates her motivation for going on the journey um, by saying like maybe I didn't do this for my dad, maybe I did this to prove to my family that I can do something right. Which is mm -hmm. definitely what the same conclusion is what that you're getting at on uh, the reason why she ended up joining the army in her father's place, and and I believe that's also what reflections was about about her trying to think of like oh no I don't fit in because I'm I'm bad at doing what society tells me to do, 
Um, so, oh, do you, um, what do you feel about that song, the Reflection song? It's a really nice song. I, I, love, uh, I mean, Le- Lisa Longa, who plays the singing voice of Mulan, has just this lovely, pretty voice that, yeah, she I, uh, she, she does a great job with the song. I think it's a very moving song. I think it resonates with people because, you know, we all kind of feel that way. It's like, you know, where do we fit in? We're, you know, all about, like, how, like, is, is what we're on the outside who we really are on the inside? Or are we wearing a mask? That sort of thing. Um yeah, so I thought I think that's a really nice song. It's real powerful and it's just it's pretty. Mhm. Oh, and also like I know like near the end of the film, she, uh, Mulan uses a fan, which is traditionally known as a feminine object, in order to finally get the up on on the villain. What's his name? Shan Yu. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That yeah. she like she ended up using not a weapon necessarily, but just a little tool to beat him. That was neat. Yeah. And so, okay, so yeah, so let's use that to transition to the villain of this film, which is Sean Yu. How do you, how do you, how do we feel about this guy? I like him as a bad guy. He's just, he's just awful. It's, it's he's, he's just like really bad. He has like no, it's like he's missing his frontal lobe or something, you know, mm-hmm. he's just all about taking over China and he doesn't really care how many people he has to hurt in order to do it, which makes it makes him a pretty compelling villain because he's just so bad it's quite an adversary for our hero yeah he'll kill as many people off screen and as implied as possible in order to get that g rating (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah but it was they they really pushed it like that that part that i'm reminded of is when like the two message he's like those two soldiers get caught by his group and he's like okay go back and give them this message and then he goes, how many men do they need to deliver a message? And it's like, one. And, like, that guy pulls back an arrow, but then they cut to black so you don't actually see him shooting the guy. But that's, like, whew, that's, that's rough. Oh, yeah. And then they uh, end up going into the uh, the village, and then they just destroy everything. They kill everyone. And they leave the, the doll there that they found, implying that they also killed the doll, the girl that the doll belonged to as well. Yeah, oh, yeah, that part is brutal, where they get to the village and, like, everyone's dead that was oh that's that's a really harsh moment because they're having this kind of lighthearted song about what kind of girl they would want to be with and then boom they're like the reality of warfare hits them yeah that's like the highest of highs and to the lowest of lows like mm-hmm. like what what do you think what what do you think about that decision to do that to just like have this giant reveal like hit you right in the middle of a chorus I think I think it was powerful. I think it made it that much more powerful because up till this point, I mean, these guys—they're just as much children as Mulan is coming into it. They don't—they've never seen battle. They don't—they don't know what to do. They don't know. Like up till this point, war is just kind of like an idea to them, something that they think they're supposed to go out and do, but like they haven't really experienced it. And once they see that town, they're—they're they're realizing what the cost is of war, like a very real awful cost. Oh, yeah, like, they do seem to have, like, this fantasy of warfare, of, like, the idea, kind of like how um, World War Two propaganda made war look look like, saying, like, ah, you gotta serve your country, it's the coolest thing in the world, um, so that they had that kind of idea with it until they actually saw the after effects of, of war <clears throat> in, 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 in that battlefield, and then also we have, uh, speaking of which, uh, let's move on to the character of Shang, the captain. What do we think about him? I like Shang. I think he's he's a compelling character. And in many ways, we get to see him grow just as much as uh, the other characters, which is really cool because you see that he's just, he's pretty inexperienced himself. Like, just as they're trying to grow as soldiers, he's trying to grow as a leader. And um, if he's hard on the guys in his troop, it's only because, you know, he's you know, on himself as well. Mm-hmm. And then we also have the what was his name? The the that that uh advi- that oh, guy. Dude. Well I forgot his name. Um, uh, he's just like an advisor or something. I don't scribe or oh, something. Chifu, that's his name, I think. Okay. I couldn't remember. Yeah, and you have that guy going down his back trying to look listen watch him like try to make any mistake that he could possibly could to put in a report. And so also, like, 
uh, he was also the general's dad. And then also in that same scene the, where he, they find the burnt village, we also find out that his dad also died. Um, and so that's supposed to be also another pretty strong moment in, in the film. Um, and I know that uh, originally in the screen, in the development process, they, the writers uh, originally didn't have Shang be the general's son until late until they decided that maybe they should make them related so they can <laughs> uh so they can have like a parallel relationship between Shang and Mulan and their each other's fathers can have like a parallel uh thing going on. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, cool. Uh-huh. And so yeah, so like that like stuff like that. And <laughs> so uh, oh, we gotta we gotta talk about the character of Mushu. What do we feel about him? I know this is a controversial topic of sorts because oh, no. some people find his character offensive. Which again, I can't speak to. I am not of Chinese descent, so I don't I don't know how offensive he is or isn't. But just from an objective standpoint, because again, I don't feel like that was ever the. Uh, the filmmaker's intent for him to be offensive they probably just thought on a very surface level oh you know there's dragon imagery in you know chinese art and stuff like that so let's make a character that's a dragon um it's hard not to love him because uh eddie murphy's just i mean have you ever really watched a movie with eddie murphy where you didn't like eddie murphy eddie murphy he's uh he's just he's great he's hilarious oh yeah he's, he's an amazing actor and comedian He's actually, yeah. I believe, like, he he hosted Saturday Night Live when he was still a cast member. That's how good he was. Oh, really? I didn't know that. That's funny. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, like, yeah, so, like, going on about the, how Mushu came to be, it's actually a lot more simple. Uh, it was because uh, Roy E. Disney, the, who was the um, the CEO at the time, uh he he wanted uh he he was he looked at like the script of Mulan he was like where's the where's the animal sidekick we need to put oh, in an animal yeah. sidekick that's always a thing that mm -hmm. does make sense yeah so they're like uh what's in China dragon put him in there actually the one that got a lot of pushback was the character of the cricket um, oh really the cricket got pushback yeah because a lot of the writers thought that the cricket did nothing for the film. But the executives like I liked I, the cricket. He was cute. I, I enjoyed him too. But yeah, so like Michael Eisner and Joe Grant were like the biggest advocates for the cricket. So whenever they would be like in story meetings, um they they would be told like, Oh, this stuff is going on and then there would be like, But where's the cricket? And, <laughs> that's, so that's great. I love that. Yeah, so let's like transition to uh, the character of the cricket. What do we feel about the him? I thought he was fun. I don't think he's quite as important as Mushu because, like, Mushu, we see more of an arc with Mushu. Like, even Mushu is going on a journey, as silly and funny as he is. Like, he, he is, and much like Mulan, is looking for acceptance, like, within the ancestors. I, I love it at the beginning where they tell him to, like, where you find out basically, like, what, oh, right, like, he was the guardian of one of the other family members, like, he got beheaded or something that oh, the yeah. family member did, so it's kind of, like, darkly humorous, but at the same time, you know, you got, you got him trying to, he's trying to prove himself as much as Milan is, but the cricket, I would say the cricket is there more for comic relief, but I feel, I still think he's fun, um, I, I enjoy, <laughs> I particularly like the part like at the end where he goes, wait, you're not lucky. You lied to me, and he was so upset with the cricket. It was it was fun. If in many ways, like the cricket is a bit more intelligent, or at least a little bit more practical than um, the Mushu is. I think that's kind of funny. Like to have this sort of like mute character who seems to know a little bit more than the characters that can speak. Yeah, sometimes like having a mute character is a lot more fun and a lot more entertaining than a character that actually talks. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why I like Tom and Jerry is so great. That's why Wiley e. Coyote is so great, like stuff like that. And so like, <laughs> so yeah, that I never like thought about that. So we have like three different characters trying to prove themselves in different ways, like how Mushu's trying to make up for his past faults, and Mulan is trying to prove herself that she can do something right within society, and Shang is trying to prove 
or trying to like uh, fill in the shoes of his general father. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we got all this stuff going on. Oh, have you ever seen the sequel? I have. I have seen the sequel, and I don't hate it other than the fact that it's not Eddie Murphy playing Mushu. Yeah. In, in, it's actually. Did you know it's like a white guy playing him? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> in that's... the second one. Yeah. Is Which he... admittedly, he does sound a little bit like Eddie Murphy, but probably not the best choice of casting. Yeah, I know. I need a. I need a re. I haven't seen it in a while. I don't remember what Mushu sounds like in that one. <laughs> Let's just say there there seems to be something not quite right about it. I guess Eddie Murphy was just kind of like, nah, not feeling it, bro. So they just kind of. But the story itself in the second one, I actually thought was pretty was was surprisingly poignant. Oh yeah, Lucy Liu was in it. Sandra O oh was also in that. Oh, one. I love them. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking at the cast list. Where is oh Mark Mosley? That's who played him. He's probably just like a sound alike or something. Yeah, he's known for being a voice double for Eddie Murphy, Patrick Stewart, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Patrick Warburton. Wow. Yeah. So he guys got some moves. Yeah, he can do some. He can do some voices. Uh, so, <clears throat> like in like in the sequel, I know that Mushu's whole thing is that he wants he wants to basically uh break up shang and mulan for his own selfish reasons yeah which is kind of a garbage thing to do in my opinion yeah. <laughs> uh but we're talking about the first one not the sequel so yeah so we're talking about the first one <laughs> yeah so we got all this stuff going on how do we feel about the these the, the uh final bit like the last act where they go in and they save the emperor oh and like what do you think about that whole reprise of be a man while they were like dressing up as women that's funny that's very ironic <laughs> that was pretty funny yeah and it, it might be like a kind of a thing where they might be saying that oh you don't need to be a man to to do these things to save china yeah maybe that's what they're trying to say yeah maybe i think it was just it's an ironic kind of thing yeah um but yeah, oh, hang on. My cat is trapped inside the room. I have to let him out. Oh, no. He's going to be really loud. But, um, no, I love that last scene where they go and save the emperor. I think it's a lot of fun. I don't know. It really cracks me up when all the guys come in dressed as women, and the two guards go, oh, it's are those the concubines? And he just goes, ugly concubines. <laughs> I just thought that was, I think that's kind of funny. Yeah, Maybe it, it shouldn't funny. be, but it was pretty funny. Yeah, and then and then all the kids were like, mommy, what's a concubine? And then they're like, oh. <laughs> Oh, let's. Hey, honey, why don't we watch Mulan again? <laughs> <laughs> I know. So like, oh yeah, and then the hawk basically turns into a chicken after he was like burned to death. Like, do like, what? Like the remember the falcon? Oh yeah, the falcon. Yeah, the in that same scene, Eddie Murphy's Mushu just like burns like the uh, the falcon to a crisp, yeah. and then he becomes a chicken. Yeah, that was kind of funny. Yeah. So, like, stuff like that. And I thought it was also kind of funny how Shang didn't put on any, any, uh, in that same scene where they were going up and infiltrate, Shang didn't put any, any, uh, makeup. And then I guess they're like, oh, how come he can't, he doesn't get to wear anything. <laughs> Shang's like, yeah, I'm not putting that on. I'm not putting that on. Ugh. Oh, and then we, <laughs> we have, like, the late, great Pat Morita as the ch emperor of China. Oh, yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. I think he did a great job. Yeah, I agree. He's just got an awesome voice, so that really worked. Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, what else would you like to talk about in, in this scene? Oh, the uh, the uh, the pool scene where she was, like, washing. Oh, my God. <laughs> I actually think that part is really funny. I mean, I will say it's a little risque for a kid's movie, mm -hmm. but I do think it's pretty funny, her reaction. She goes, oh, hey, guys, I was just... Taking a bath and I'm clean, so I'm gonna go. <laughs> it was so funny. Yeah, just because I'm 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 actually living like a man doesn't mean I have to smell like one. Oh, drills yeah. are told them. So yeah, so <laughs> it was funny because in the sequel she like wasn't shower she wasn't taking a bath. Oh wait, wait, what happened in the sequel? Because in the sequel, like she was always taking guard duty, so she wouldn't have to 
take a bath with all the guys so they wouldn't, you know, probably my favorite part of that scene in this movie. And then the guys run out and Mushu goes, oh no, there are some things I, they are bound to notice. Like, oh yeah. That's so funny. Oh that yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, okay. Like in the reboot, like, yeah, she, they did the exact opposite. And yeah. Yeah. I bet, like in the in the thing where they were like, "How are we gonna do this scene where she like does takes a she takes a bath?" And they were like, "How about she doesn't take a bath?" <laughs> Smart. That's changing things up. Yeah. All right. So now we have like all this uh, all these pretty cool stuff going on in in this film. So let's talk about the music. What do we think about the music? Oh, the music's great. I love the music and. Uh... I love the music in this uh, in this movie. It's just, it's very pretty. You can hear how they're kind of trying to take inspiration from like uh, the Chinese style of music, mm-hmm. like uh, some Chinese influences, which I think is cool. It makes it fit the time period. It makes it fit the per- period where they are. And I noticed they kept that like in the themes that they used in the sequel. So I think that's pretty cool that they uh, a movie that kind of like reminded me of Mulan that I watched not too long ago. It's an animated film called Over the Moon. You seen it? Oh, I have seen it. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's really good. Like I noticed that 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 movie also takes place in China, and the the music is very similar. You, like you can see they're taking some influence from a uh, ch- uh, Chinese music, which is really neat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that and then Over the Moon, Philippa So is in it, and I'm a fan of Hamilton. So. Oh yes, I loved her. She was great. Yeah, especially um, the rapping. Scene. I was real disappointed that Lei Salonga didn't make an appearance. Lei Salonga didn't make an appearance. Oh, she probably should no. have. She should have. Yeah. So like. Um, yeah, so, like, what is your favorite song in this film? A lot of people, I know a lot of people say, like, make a man out of you, but... That's hard. I really like a bunch of them. I love Make a Man Out of You. I really like Reflection. And I love the Girl Worth Fighting For song, so... Aren't those, like, the only three songs? So I picked, like, all All of them? Okay. (laughs) Well, then there's that one at the beginning. I don't know. Probably Reflection would probably win, because it's just really pretty. That is a very pretty one. I think that one was nominated for an Oscar. I'm not 100% sure, though. I think it was. Okay. Yeah, mine is the, uh, the, the, uh, Girl With Fighting For song. That is a really good one. That one's my favorite. It is very jumpy and stuff. And then when it ends, I can always say, like, oh, then now everyone's dead. (laughs) Yup. That's what I say, like, when I listen to it on Spotify. So, uh, oh, and then we have, um, (laughs) Um. Oh, um. Oh, the animation. We they actually had like, uh, took a lot of influence with Chinese painting and watercolor, in in this in this film, especially with the fire and the smoke. Oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah, I didn't. I guess I didn't notice that quite as much, except at the beginning when they were kind of like doing like the Chinese uh, calligraphy. Yeah. And then there are oh, people, yeah. Just that made me think that that one part where like he was having the cricket write out something, and the, cr- the cricket was like tap dancing, and it sounded like a typewriter. Oh, that was yeah. really funny. I yeah. Liked that. And then oh, and they also like found a panda out of nowhere. Oh yeah, they did mm-hmm. find a panda. That part really cracked me up when they were like trying to trick the trick the guy. I thought that was that was really funny. There were just some really funny moments. All yeah. all pretty much with Eddie Murphy, probably. Oh, yeah. My favorite line, he says, is near the end of the film, and <laughs> it's so dumb, and yet I love it so much, is when they're about to go and fight the hunts, and he goes, let's go kick some honey buns, and then he laughed so hard the first time I watched it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, I was thinking about that as you were saying the sentence. It was like, oh, I think <laughs> it's going to be that one, because that one's my favorite, too. <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. It looks like uh, the cricket was actually played by voice actor legend Frank Welker. Oh, that, that, no surprise there. My dad usually makes the joke that in the 80s, there were there were three voice actors, and two of them were Frank Welker. Oh, that's probably a good, you, that's probably a good if joke. If there's ever, like, a character that's, like, you know, it makes just weird noises throughout the entire movie, odds are it was Frank Welker. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's the guy to call. He's like, I'm the noise animal guy. I'm the animal noise guy. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, let me see. And uh, is there any other things that we'd like to talk about for this particular film? Um, no, not really. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a fun, poignant, and cool movie. Oh, yeah. Should, uh, oh, let's see. I, I know that a lot of 
people in China said that it was a bit offensive. What do we say about that? I'm sorry, what was the question? About China being, like, people in China believing that it is a, a bit offensive. Well, again, that's, that's, I mean, that's really not for me to say. Like, I don't know if, if it could be considered offensive or not. I do know that in some ways it is inaccurate to, like, the culture in some ways. Like, I remember I, uh, that in my, in, when I was studying, like, Chinese art and stuff, this idea of Mulan leaving her family without telling them, like, well, that makes sense to, for, to us from an American standpoint that you would kind of, like, take a hold of your own destiny. In the Chinese culture, that would have been, like, not cool at all because uh, there's a very much a strong emphasis on family and bringing your family honor. So she would most likely have told her family is that a little bit better in the newer movie. But at the same time, I feel like her coming back and apologize kind of does speak to that honor, that sort of like that honor based society. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I do think that I do strongly believe that, filmmakers definitely were not intending to be offensive if anything they were just you know they were making things on the surface so they weren't thinking about the deeper implications so yeah. um so i don't know i guess that's not really for me to say like i think you can still enjoy it even if it's not super accurate but uh i mean if you don't want to watch it then that's totally fine yeah like also um this is other thing it's a little bit nitpicky but i, I hear a lot of people say it was uh, the scene where Mulan cut her hair, where people say that that doesn't really make any sense because in China, especially that in that period of time and during the uh, Northern Wei Dynasty, men having long hair wasn't exactly uncommon. Yeah, it, I think that was just for dramatic effect, which admittedly, it was pretty dramatic. Oh yeah, they did it the most dramatic way they possibly could. Which I can't help but love how I love dramatic scenes like that. It's so it's so dramatic, but I just I love the good yeah. dramatic. Have you ever, the hair, let down the hair, or something like that. It's it's powerful. Yeah. Have you ever watched the anime uh, Death Note? I have not. Yeah. Well, it, there was this one scene where the main character was like, "I can write with my right hand, and then I'll take a pa a potato chip." And eat it. And it was like the most dramatic. Very, thing. very dramatic. <laughs> it was like the most funniest thing I've ever seen in an anime. So yeah, so uh, there's all that uh, background going on. But this particular film did not have as much uh, controversy going on as the remake that came out uh, last year. Um, so I guess that's a win. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it looks like this film got made three hundred and four million dollars. So I would say it's a success. It's a success. Yeah, I'd say it was too, and people still love it today. So. Oh yeah, the yeah. animation like holds up. Oh yeah, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I I do really love the animation. Mm -hmm. Oh, also, like, let's talk about the whole thing about the lotus flower, where the dad—I don't remember his name—where Fazu. I think it's pronounced Fa Zhao, but they, they say it. They say Fa Zhu in the in the movie. Yeah. Oh yes. Um. And once you die, I have another thing we should talk about. Okay. Let's hear. So he talks about the the flower, and in the beginning of the film, he says, "Uh, the the flower that blooms the latest is usually the most beautiful of all." Because I think believe he say that she's like a late bloomer in the whole trying to fit into society thing. Yeah. All right. Well, what were you gonna say? Oh, no, I was just saying, like, I would feel greatly disappointed if we didn't at least talk about the grandma once, because she's just a treasure. I love the grandma. <laughs> oh, yeah. Movie. So let's talk about Grandma Fa, I believe. Is yeah, it's name. his mother. All right, so what, So she is a very, like, pretty fun, pretty fun character. Yeah, I, I just love her so much. I just love how... She's very much a grandma. Like, every every aspect of her just seems very much like a grandma. I enjoy the part at the beginning where she takes the cricket and she closes her eyes and walks across the street to see if he's lucky or whatever. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, now that's what I call a defining action. <laughs> I know. I just love she goes, how useful can they be? They're dead <laughs> or something Whoa. like that. I just thought that oh, was funny. snap. That's, that's what I call being a savage. And then, yes, like a for sun, sure. then the sunglasses just come down. Uh, all right, so that's the Mulan. That's Mulan for you. Um, mm -hmm. Would we recommend this film? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a good movie. I definitely say it's probably not for younger kids. Like, I feel like you should be like, probably wouldn't be great to show this to your kids like when they're super young because it does deal with some tough issues that for younger kids might be a little bit too much, I'd say. But I think everybody else, like just in general, I think it's a fun movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would say ignore the G rating on this film. Yeah, I'd say it's more PG. It's definitely more of a PG movie um, because it does deal with a lot of like warfare and a lot of violence and stuff. Um, it does deal with death and, you know, that kind of thing. So I would say, like, leave this for the older kids. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so uh, what would you, what rating would you give this film? Um, I'd give it, like, an 8 out of 10, probably. It's a mm. real good movie, I'd say. Yeah, let me see. I would give it um, an 8 out of 10 as well, because I think that's a fair assessment. Cool, cool. All right, so that's Mulan for you. Uh, check it out whenever you can, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to A Vision Podcast, home of Wacky Talkies, The Kingdom, Evil Exists, and many more.